Hey guys, it looks like it worked this time. I don't know what happened on Friday. Okay, so I'm going to put a message in the chat. And we'll see how that goes. Hopefully it all works. So I've got about another 15 minutes before I'm supposed to actually go live. But because on Friday when I did the video with the girls, with Paige and Kaya, it never, the video never came up. It was just me talking in the background. So I just want to make sure it works this time. <laughs> so if you have any questions, if you guys have farming questions or YouTube channel questions, what other questions could you ask me? <clears throat> You can ask me any questions you want to. So usually the chat button is down kind of next to the share button. And so if you want to join the live chat, just go click that button that says join the live chat and it should come up. Otherwise, I get to just kind of sit here and talk to myself for a little while, which um, I guess I'm pretty good at that considering how much I'm on camera. Um, Maybe I'll start out that today I'm going to talk about spinning. And you guys are welcome to come up with other topics that you want me to cover. Um, I'm a little bit tied down to the fact that I have to have my computer with me wherever it is that I go and film. And so we could do a live show on how to make butter. We could do a live show on how to use the cream separator. Um, I think it would be a little bit tricky to do a live show on how to butcher rabbits just because of the nature of it's a little bit messy. But I'm going to go ahead. Brad and Tommy, if you're watching, I don't know how I'm going to do this for a full hour. Okay, so I'm going to tip this down because today is about spinning. I need you to be able to see the spinning wheels. So we'll see how this goes. First off... What I wanted to talk about was the way that I learned how to spin. And the way that I learned how to spin was by sticking a sharp pencil inside of half of a potato. Because all you need is a stick with a weight on the bottom that will allow that stick to spin quickly. And let's see, where did I put it? I made it just for today. So this is what I upgraded to when I was, I think I was 15. And what it is, is it's a, it's a 3 8 inch dowel and two CDs. I'm showing you this so that you can make them yourself. And then a special rubber grommet right here on the inside. Now, the reason the rubber grommet is special is because it allows the, da the um, CDs to move up and down on the dowel so that you can adjust it. You can use it as a top whirl or a bottom whirl, just depending on what it is you want to do. And so this is what I moved up to and it took me a year to find the right size grommet I meant to save that so that you guys could know what part it was um, I will try to find the link to tell you where exactly to get this grommet because it's not the normal grommet that's at the at the hardware store if you use anything bigger than a 3 8 inch dowel you can't get enough spin on this. It just it just won't spin fast enough and it's too big for your fingers to be able to twist easily. So no bigger than 3 8 inch on your dowel. Okay? And you want to use two. I'll see if I can show you that there's two here. You want to use two CDs on it because otherwise it's not heavy enough. See? There's two of them there. So there we go. Now, once you have your little drop spindle put together, that's what it looks like, you need a leader. And this is what you connect your fiber to. So a leader can be any piece of string. And again, you guys are welcome to ask me questions. Enter chat message or link here. Group chat is on, so make sure to click the button that says join the group chat. I might be doing it wrong. That's a distinct possibility. But I'm <laughs> if, if you guys know how to do it, make sure to email me and tell me that I'm doing it wrong. Now, when I have my drop spindles, I prefer to have a little wedge cut out on two sides here 
and here. The reason is is that as your as the bobbin fills up, it starts to try and slip off the side rather than catching very well. But I'll just show you how it works today. So a lot of times uh, they'll put a little hook in the top. I'll see if I have one so I can show you. And you can just screw it in, but it does add to the cost of making the spindle, if that makes sense. So here's a little teeny tiny um, hook. I don't have my drill in here. A lot of times your dowel will split if you don't pre-drill, but sometimes it won't. So we'll see if we can get it to go in. And the reason you would use the hook is um, sometimes if you don't use a hook, your spindle can be just a little bit wobbly. Um, but, oh, I can't get it in. I will show you the way that I prefer to do it. So here's your leader. Here's your dowel. I'm going to flip it like that. See, see that? Okay. So now, see if I can grab some fiber. Why would you want to know how to use a drop spindle? Well, if you have some kind of fiber, it doesn't hold its structural integrity to make something like socks unless it's been spun. Each of the neighbors uh, lends structural integrity to each other. It's like having trying to break a package of pencils as, a tr as opposed to trying to break one pencil. It's just that having them twisted on each other just makes them strong. And so in a prepper situation, in an emergency situation, if you didn't have a way to make socks and you had flax or you had a sheep, which isn't very likely, <laughs> so I think that that reason is just a little bit ridiculous. But if you had a sheep <clears throat> in a prepper situation, this is how you would actually spin. There, there is more to it because you do need to do some prepping of the fiber. But um, as far as like the basics go, this is how you do it. So I just attached it to my leader. And, whoa, we're going to have some psychedelic light going on, aren't we? Okay, so that's what your yarn looks like now. So now I'm going to unhook the leader. And I'm going to spin it onto the bottom of my spindle. See how that's spinning on? Okay, so now I'm going to hook it again. And, yes, it does take some practice. Okay. And once you get better, what you do is that you, you use it standing up. It's much faster standing up than it is sitting down. And if you're using a drop spindle, you always want to wrap your fiber around your wrist so that it's out of your way. So. That is a drop spindle, and I have spun yarn for socks and for children's sc uh, scarves and children's sweaters and things like that. So, the reason I'm showing you this one, I do have other spindles, but the reason I'm showing you this one is because with this one, when you have all this full of yarn, what you do is you pop the um, you pop this part off. See? And you grab another one. Another dowel, sorry, not just another one. And you pop it on, or you don't pop it on because this one's being stubborn. And once you have that on, you go through the same thing. You put a leader on the bottom, you spin it, and you fill this bobbin up. Once you have two bobbins full, what you do is you take the yarn off and you wind it into a ball and you wind it into a ball and it takes forever. I'm showing you the cheapest way first. <laughs> and you take those balls and you put them in jars. And you take a nail 
and you poke a hole in the top and then you put the lid on in a way so that the sharp jagged edges point outward otherwise they'll catch on your yarn okay and so now you have two singles they're called singles because there's they're they're just one thread so now you have two singles and you're going to take a third dowel so you had two you have two dowels full of single right and now you're going to take a third dowel and put this on and this is called plying and what it does is it takes your two singles and it puts them it, it turns them into yarn rather than just being singles so if you did your singles going counterclockwise then you're going to spin you're going to do your plying clockwise and it's really hard to ply while sitting down Let's see if I can do it it's so much easier with a lazy case so the next thing I'm going to show you is a lazy case so now you can see I have two yarns coming up and being spun in the opposite direction from what they were spun before okay And the way that you can tell that you're spinning in the opposite direction is that when you let it go back in on itself, it'll twist into a yarn. If, if once you let it go, you have two yarns that are trying to separate from each other, you know you're, you're trying to spin it in the same direction rather than the opposite direction. Okay? And then again, you spin it onto the bottom of your drop spindle, and, it be, and this is your bobbin again. So that's what it'll look like. Okay, so now we've got to that point. Now that's the tedious way to do it. The tedious, slow way to do it is to put it in, is to wind it into balls and then put it into jars. The fast way to do it is to create yourself a lazy cake. And I did this one for five bucks. I'd never seen, I didn't do this from pattern. All you really need, you can do this with a shoe box. All you really need is eye bolts. Okay, see those eye bolts? They're high enough off the ground, they're high enough off the board, so that when you're pulling the yarn off and it's trying to spin off, where did it go? I already took it off, didn't I? Um, okay, guys, look at what I'm doing because I can't remember what I'm doing. Then you can tell me what I'm doing. So, when you have this full of your yarn, your singles, what you do, well, you, first you pop this off, but I want, I want to show it intact so that you can understand what I'm doing, okay? That's how it sits. And so when I'm plying, I just pull it off and it just spins off. Does that make sense? And that way you can have a single here and a single here, and you can ply off of it, and you don't have to wind the ball. The reason I have the yogurt lids is because once you take this, um, the CD off, you need something to, to hold it so that it doesn't spin so fast that it tries to come out of the lazy cake. So I don't know if I could have made that any more complicated, but that's how it works, and it really was just six bucks. And I did use the locking nuts on this so that it wasn't trying to come undone on me. Um, you do want the eye bolts to be just a little bit bigger than the dowel, but not much. But you see how this is high enough, high enough up that that is never going to get stopped by the board. So that's a lazy cake. Okay, so how much does it cost to make one of those? Between the grommet and the dowels and the CDs, it costs, um, it depends, if you're buying them in bulk, it doesn't cost that much. Um, I think maybe $5 total to make it, and it gives you a set that gives you two to ply with, or sorry, two to spin singles with and, and one to ply with, and it's pretty cool. That doesn't include the Lazy Kate. The Lazy Kate was another five bucks. So, now, if you don't want to make it yourself, here's my shameless plug. I put all that together, and I add roving and raw locks and mohair 
and um, a little brush to be able to brush things with, and I have that on my Etsy store. So there's my shameless plug, but it will cost you about $5 to, to make the whole kit yourself if you don't want to get it for me. If you do want to get it for me, it's obviously Dirt Patch Heaven on Etsy. So let's move on. Now, when I started to dye my own yarn, um, I was a little bit afraid of the chemicals and I didn't really know what I was doing. And my favorite channels on YouTube that are about spinning and dyeing, um, first is Chemnitz, because she showed me how to dye with uh, food coloring. And I really, really like her. And then it's Natalie from Na Namaste Farms. She's amazing. Absolutely love her. She's the one who taught me not to really be afraid of the dyes. And then the last one was Ashley Martineau. And this is her book, Spinning and Dying Yarn, if you can see that. And in here, she actually has a plan, like a schematic, of how to build your own spinning wheel with PVC. It'll cost under $100. I have talked to her personally, and she says that it's a little bit squeaky. And obviously, it wouldn't be a production wheel, but if you want to try your hand at something like that, it could be fun. I haven't tried it personally. But this is a really good book if you're wanting to get in, the back. If you're wanting to get into dyeing, dyeing and spinning. The other thing that Ashley does is she has individual videos on spinning. She's an art art yarn spinner. And I'll show you what an art yarn is. We'll see if I lose everybody when I stand up and try to find an, an art yarn. Um, Paige likes to do art yarn. Let's see if I can make a mess. This is some of Paige's art yarn. It really holds on to the curl and the integrity of the fiber. And she did this with a lock spinning, which means instead of carding it, she just spun it from the fleece hole. And I, I dyed this. So this is one of Paige's art yarns. And a traditional yarn, let's see if I even have a traditional yarn. It's been a little while since I spun one. Um, let's see if I can find one. A traditional yarn is very even, and it doesn't have big globs on it. This is a traditional yarn, and it's, it isn't even, this one isn't even really a traditional yarn because you can see the way that it, in some spots it's a tighter spin than in others, like this green right here is a looser twist than say here. Okay, so it's, this isn't even a, really a traditional yarn, um, but that's what that looks like. And so, I don't remember why I was telling you that. Oh, the difference in the spinning wheels. So if you decide that you want to go for spinning wheels instead, you're like, I, I don't want to mess with the slow nature of a drop spindle. I would say that it's good to start with the drop spindle just because it teaches you discipline. It teaches it because that, that yarn is hanging, that drop spindle is hanging from your yarn. And so if your yarn doesn't have integrity, it'll just break. So it teaches you really early on to have good structure in your yarn rather than something that's going to fall apart because a spinning wheel is going to pull the yarn out of your hands and if you don't have enough twist in it or you didn't draft correctly so that it is structurally sound, you'll be more frustrated with the spinning wheel than you would be with the drop spindle. So that is why I say start with the drop spindle. So first off, the most important thing about a spinning wheel is your drafting. So there is a term that is called pre-drafting. And what pre-drafting is, is to open up your fibers and prepare them to be spun before you ever approach your spinning wheel. It's what is the difference between a crappy yarn and a really good yarn. And the way that you pre-draft is just to open it up so that you can see the air. You, can, you should be able to see air through your fiber. I, when I'm teaching a child how to spin, I call it, let's make it into a spider web because you want everything to be really open. And especially if what you're doing is buying roving, which is commercially processed fiber, 
it's going to be packed in together. It won't have a lot of the crimp left. A lot of the character of your fiber will be gone if you buy roving. You can add character back into your roving um, with the way that you pre-draft it or with the way that you card it. But um, I don't I don't love to use roving straight just because it is so it 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 is very lacking in personality. This is I don't even remember when I made this. I think this has a lot of Angora rabbit in it. I'm pretty sure this has a ton of Angora rabbit in it. It might be all Angora rabbit. It's so stinking soft and open. What was this? Sometimes you come back to old projects and you're like, what did I use this for? It's really pretty, but what did I use this for? So that's what pre-drafting looks like. And the purpose is that you're able to move the fiber through your fingers at the speed that you want to move it through your fingers rather than um, kind of getting caught up in it as you go and not being able to really retrace your steps. So when you're first starting out with the spinning wheel, the ones that I use currently are Spinolution. And... The reason that I went with that was because I was really attracted to the fact that they said it was ergonomically correct. And because I spent a lot of hours in front of a spinning wheel, having it not hurt my body was kind of a big deal. That being said, any spinning wheel that claims to be all purpose, to varying degrees will be all purpose. But when you're making a very specific kind of yarn, you want your spinning wheel to be good at making that specific kind of yarn. So the first wheel I'm going to show you is specifically a beginner wheel. It is not a production wheel. The difference between beginner and production is that production wants to go fast because usually production is something you're trying to sell. The more time you have into it, the more money you have into it, the more time you lose. And so this is the polywog. And I will point you at the polywog. And it is a child, it, it's advertised as a child's wheel. And it, it's actually extreme, it's their lightest wheel and it's very small. I just put sand in it. This is the first time I've used sand in it. And I'm finding that it's slowing me down pretty badly. Previously, when I would get into the higher um, ratios, that my, the machine would start to jitter because it was really light. And now I have sand in it, but it, it does mean that it's kind of slowed things down and made it a little bit harder to spin. And what you see right here, this extra piece right here, I don't know if you can see it. This extra piece right here, this is the accelerator. I, the price on this one, if I remember correctly, is 349 right now and that's with free shipping I do sell them but what I would say about this is that if you're if you're planning on, on doing a lot of spinning if if you have somebody else that you know would like to spin that you would like to gift a wheel to later this is the wheel that I would go to if you're planning on just being a hobby spinner without doing a lot of specialty yarn this is a great wheel if, if, if you just want to sit down and spend a few minutes spinning every day um, it's a great wheel. It's a great wheel for a child. I do prefer to spin it without the accelerator. I feel like it excels much more as a worsted weight um, wheel. It, I mean, it does just fine at this, but when you're doing a finer yarn, a lot of times you want there to be a higher, every time you do a finer yarn, you want there to be a higher twist to rotation. Okay, and this one is pretty loose. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a terribly tight yarn, which, which means, is it functional? Does it really do what I need it to do at the moment? Yes, but it doesn't do it quickly. I'm pedaling pretty quickly and it's not putting that twist in terribly quickly. It's doing it fine. But if I was needing to sell this yarn, I would need it to be, I would just need it to be more polished. So not an expensive wheel it it it's it's good at what it does for the price does that make sense as i as i badly explain something that i sell myself it comes with um 
these little stakes in it so that it, it, it has a lazy cake built in, in other words, so you don't ever have to wind it into a ball. The girls like this. Kaya, she is an exuberant spinner. She really, really likes to get physically into things, and she gets really excited about things, and she actually prefers my hopper because it pulls a lot harder, and it spins a lot faster. So what I'm spinning right now is for Corinne. This is for the Fresh Princess. And this is a Romney cross, and it's gray. She really likes gray. The reason, So the reason I'm spinning on this wheel instead of on my hopper is because this one will do a finer yarn. It doesn't spin as fast as my hopper, but it will spin it finer without having to make as many modifications as long as I have the accelerator on it. And because Corinne likes a lot of detail in her hats, I needed a fine, very consistent yarn rather than an art yarn, if that makes sense. And I don't even know what time it is. I need to make sure that I don't go into Brad's time slot. So did I explain to you guys what we're doing with Brad and Tommy? That we're going to do like a, like a family night broadcast where Brad comes after me, and then after that comes Tommy, and Brad's going to talk about his fun Q&A type stuff, and Tommy likes to talk about kind of current events and, and the state of the world and the craziness that's going on, and so we're going to work on this. Let's see, I did want to show you the hopper, so that's the polywog. Because the feet are close together, if you're a really large person, it might be uncomfortable to spin on it because your toes have to be really close together. Okay, so this is the hopper. It's just a little bit heavier, and it looks smaller in all the pictures that I've seen, but it's actually kind of a honking, honking wheel. Okay, so let's see if I can skip back a little bit so you can see. Now what I'm going to show you right now is called a Navajo ply. And what a Navajo ply is, is it's like your chain stitching. If you've ever crocheted, a Navajo ply is like your chain stitching while you're spinning. So this one, the hopper comes with a lazy cake that fits onto it, but I accidentally got the wrong one. So the one that I have goes to the other wheels and doesn't um, doesn't fit on this one. So the other thing that I like about the spin illusion wheels is the speed with which you can take off your bobbins. With the traditional wheel, you have to play with drive bands and everything in order to take your bobbins off. But these ones just pop off. They are magnetic. See that? Isn't that cool? So, and I don't know how to figure out if there's a chat from anybody. I'm so sorry. Okay. So I'm going to just pop it right back on. It doesn't have a leader on it, so I need to put one on. It amazes me how much of a learning curve there is on all this technology on the computer as far as like live shows. We tried to do a live show where we could figure out how to uh, do it just straight from YouTube rather than from the Google Hangouts. And um, I had to add another program and it just was really, really overwhelming. It's a good thing that John knows how to do these things because I get really <sighs> frustrated when I can't figure out how to make something work the first time. Okay, so whenever you use these particular lazy cakes, you need to make sure that the squares are facing up rather than the plastic. And Ashley Martineau is the one who introduced me to the spin illusion wheels by the way. And um, if you're looking for something more detailed than what I'm able to do right here, especially with the art yarns, because I'm really a traditional yarn girl. I'm, 
I'm not really used to using the art yarns. And the reason is, is because art yarns are really just that. They are a, they're a yarn that is a work of art, but not necessarily meant to be functional. They can be functional, but by nature, they don't have to be like with the traditional yarn. All right, so I'm gonna back this up just a little bit. Okay, so the way that you do this, if you've ever crocheted, so I have my single ply. I don't have a second ply because I'm going to Navajo spin. So I'm going to go in the opposite, opposite direction from which I was originally spinning. Okay, so I was spinning clockwise. So now I'm going to spin counterclockwise. And you see how I'm doing that? That I'm chain chain stitching is that am I even saying that that right I am making a chain like you would if you were crocheting okay the nice thing about the hopper with some with a with a <coughs> apply like this is that it has a very strong pull a lot of traditional spinning wheels have a very light pull or they don't spin fast enough onto they, the twist doesn't go in quickly enough compared to how hard it pulls and the hopper has a really big pull i am happy to talk about something else guys like goats or something but if i'm going to sit here and just talk to myself i don't know how to uh how to talk about anything that isn't just right in front of me um Let's see, things that are happening on the farm right now. John has the RV up and running, and last night the girls, he and the girls slept out in it just to test run it. And what we have come down to is that if we end up staying here, um, we will use that RV for woofers. I finally bit the bullet. My little brother is a woofer. If you don't know what a woofer is, I should probably explain that. Okay, so a woofer is usually a young person that comes and works on your farm to learn how to farm. And what they get out of it is the education and they get room and board. You don't generally pay them. And they come and they be like an apprentice farmhand type of a person, which I think is absolutely brilliant. My brother is a woofer and he absolutely loves it. He's been at the same farm for a really, really long time. You guys see how this is working? So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to get distracted. So we have this RV that we got from our neighbor. He, he, we had approached him about a trade. We have an old farm truck and we were, John had asked him, can we trade you our old farm truck in exchange for this RV that's been sitting out in your back property for 15 years? And instead our neighbor just said, no, I'm not using it. You go ahead and take it. <laughs> he had just purchased like a 20 foot long. Do they make them that long? It's a brand new fancy hoodie duty RV. And he, that's just how our neighbor is. He's pretty amazing. But anyway, he gave it to us and John has it up and running. It didn't need anything more than an oil change and to change the fuel filter. That was all that needed to be changed. And so it, the, the thing is, is that if we're getting ready to sell our house, I have some things that need to be tidied up and cleaned up and, and help with that. And so I, I, let's see, two days ago, I put my farm up on Woofer to put my name out there to have somebody come and live with us and help with the farm, either to get it ready to sell or to actually do the farming work itself. And so that was really exciting. And so the girls did that test run last night to make sure that the heater and everything worked. Um, let's see, I think it's turning out pretty. I'll have to show it to you as soon as I'm finished. So this ends tonight at six my time. That's when this is over. So we'll see how long I can just sit here and talk to myself about spinning. Let's see, what else is there? Um, chamomile is due to kid in July. She always has triplets, so that will be super exciting. We're really, really hoping to get a dough out of her this time. Every other time, 
we've had bucklings. I just want one doe, you know, just one. That would be so amazing. Um, however, if she doesn't give us a doe, we will retain one of her bucks this year. She's just such, she is such a good goat. Um, Empress is just about to wean off her babies. We put them all out in pasture today, which was super fun. And I have kept a really close eye on them today because anytime you put babies out and, and they're on a, a rope or anything, you have to be so careful that there's nothing around that they can get caught on. And um, you just have to be really, really careful when you're first training them to, to be on a rope like that. So let's see what else happened today. Um, we put the Muscovy ducklings out into the backyard. So they are out there with our khaki Campbell babies. We got about, we got four khaki Campbell ducklings and three um, Indian runners. They're supposed to be um, good layers. We've had them before, uh, but we haven't raised them from babies before. So. Uh, what had happened was is that the Muscovy dad um, couldn't be kept in with the mom because he was attacking the ducklings that were male. He was very jealous of them. So we had to separate out the Muscovy dad. But then the Muscovy mom kept wandering off and trying to get in with the Muscovy dad. And the babies were wandering off on their own too. So I thought, okay, they if they were already wandering off and separating from each other at this point, we can just separate them completely. So we took the Muscovy babies and put them in with the babies that we had purchased. It's been really hard to find specifically Khaki Campbell's or any kind of laying duck lately in our feed stores and I didn't want to have to order 30 of them and so when we found four Khaki Campbell's we bought them all and then bought a few of the Indian runners. So. Originally, we had kept them in the kitchen until they got a little bit older, and then we put them out in the greenhouse with a little bit of a heat lamp at night, and now they're out and about on their own in the backyard with the adult khaki Campbells, and they're all getting along just fine. So I'm really happy about that. There will be too many of them to keep in the backyard permanently all together, because right now I think we have, let's see, we have six Muscovy ducklings. Oh, I got distracted. Okay, so the point of that was that the Muscovy, Muscovy ducks are very, very good setters. And last time I had her getting ready to set, there were two ducks out there, two uh, drakes, that were fighting over who got to breed with her. So now I've got her out there with the dad, the drake, the Muscovy drake. And their reunion was jubilant and passionate. And so I'm hoping that here within a very short time she'll have enough eggs laid to start again. And muscovies are known for that, for going out and setting a batch of eggs and coming out with 20 babies. So far we've never had more than eight hatch out, but she had four eggs in there that weren't fertile. And um, I so hopefully this time around having them, them together so much it'll make a difference. So what was I saying about that? Okay, so we have our four Khaki Campbell ducks that are laying right now that are our egg lakers in the back um, yard. And um, I am caught. My baby cake is caught. And let's see, what was I saying? So we have 20 ducks out, is it 20? Four khaki Campbells that are adults, seven of our new layers, that's 11, plus six is 17, so almost 20. Um, and so what we'll end up doing, those four ducks were keeping down the slugs very nicely. No complaints there. The only reason we have all the ducklings in there with them now is just to keep them safe because they're in, a, in the enclosed backyard where we don't have a problem with predators. And so as soon as all the ducklings get just a little bit bigger, we will put them back out into the back pasture so that they will keep all the weeds around the trees down. I wish I could figure out how to let you ask questions. But I don't know how. Um, 
So I think I'm going to talk to Brad and Tommy about maybe making it a half hour show instead of an hour because I really feel like I've already said everything that I have to say, unless you guys could ask questions. And since I can't figure out how to make that happen, I'm not sure what to do. Um, so a three ply, not a three ply, a Navajo ply has a, a different texture and a different look than a regular two or three ply. And that's because it, it's kind of, it, it's like a braid. And so you have, it, it's just, it has a texture of its own. Rather than just looking at the colors of the yarn when you have a Navajo, Navajo ply, you end up looking at, at the swirls and, and, the, and the texture of the yarn itself. The thing you have to be careful about, though, with the Navajo ply is that the colors can get really muddy because they loop back on themselves. And so if you have a really, really special uh, yarn that you're making, something that you paid a lot of money to buy the roving for, you probably don't want to do a Navajo ply on it unless you're really, really good at it and you know where your color changes are going to be. Because it's kind of like taking a really special roving and putting it through a carding machine. What it does is it takes all the fibers and amalgamates them so that they're all right next to each other so you don't have any distinctive, co any distinctive colors. And I don't really know how this one is going to turn out. I decided to do it as a Navajo ply halfway through rather than at the beginning. Like I, I, was, I was finishing spinning the single when I decided to do a Navajo ply. And the reason was is I feel like the Navajo ply is really soft and um, I like how it looks. And I really, I Navajo, let's see, barber pole is what happens when you have two colors that are, um, that stay the same when you do, how do, how do I put this? So if you had a blue single and a red single and you did a two ply out of them. It would look like a barber pole because they would twist around each other and they're just two colors twisting around each other. It can be really, really pretty doing something like that if you switch your colors a lot and have different shades of blue and different shades of red and you change it frequently. Um, that can be really, really pretty. It's kind of like a technicolor barber pole. And it can be, it can just be really, really fun. Um, Let's see if I can finish this up so you can see it. Because I, I don't think you can see it very well with the sun coming in the way it is. Let's see. Other news. Um, I'm thinking about cutting down on my videos rather than doing a daily video. Instead, I'm thinking about doing a once a week really good video and then doing the braid girls and then just having this so that I was only making three videos a week. The way that it works out for those of you who are YouTubers and, and would like to know that the way it works out. Say for instance, say for instance, this is a hypothetical. I was making $600 a month making uh, 30 videos a month. So, so if I make a daily video, that's 30 videos a month and I was making $600 off that. If instead I switched and did three videos a week on my YouTube channel and did one really great video on my Patreon account, <clears throat> um, it would offset, it would hopefully offset the, the money that I would lose by not doing a daily video. And it would mean I would have to do a lot fewer videos. Because I don't know about you guys, but when I do a daily video, it feels like to me, I'd rather see a really well-made video rather than kind of a hack video that's put up just, just to have a daily video up. That's just me. But at the same time, like when Brad from Big Family Homestead, when he switched over and started doing daily vlogs, I noticed that I was watching his channel a lot more because I was kind of addicted to their family. What do you guys think? Do you prefer daily videos? where you kind of just get to see the personality of our family? Or do you prefer once a week just a really, really amazing hit it out of the park homesteading how-to video? 
I'm not really sure which direction to go. I go back and forth on it so much, but I do know that when I do daily videos, I get really stressed out about the obligations that I have to other people. I, I, I have really weird dreams about it. Um, let's see, what else? The pay, the, not the Patreon. <coughs> the Etsy store is doing really well. I've had requests for other books. Um, and, okay, so here's something fun to talk about. Um, so I noticed that I was doing a lot of different types of gardening right now. I have the, the straw bale hotbeds that I did out in the greenhouse. I have the, um, Hugo culture hotbed that I have in the greenhouse. And then I have the back to Eden spot up in the front where the pigs used to be, where I've got a foot and a half, maybe two feet of wood mulch on top of where the pigs were. That's where I had my pumpkin patch last year. The pumpkins came up volunteer after the pigs had eaten pumpkins there. And then now I'm doing a row garden up in the one spot in my property that I have to use a sprinkler in order to keep it from looking really ugly because it's right in front of the house. So I'm not willing to water lawn. And so I've put in a row garden there that's a traditional row garden. And now next to that, I'm going to do a lasagna garden. And so the reason I'm talking about this is that I decided of all the things that I haven't seen out there, what I haven't seen is in the same year, a person doing all of these different methods at the same time and comparing them. And so that's kind of where my brain is going right now is that to do a video series comparing the row garden to the lasagna garden, to the hotbed, to the straw bale, to the hugo culture, to the back to Eden. That's a lot. But what I have found, I know it sounds like it's way too much to keep up on, but I'm doing small plots of each, and the, the, the raised hotbeds are so easy to maintain that because I don't weed them, all I do is water them. And I don't have to fertilize them because they've got all that rabbit manure and everything in them. So I find that I have so little to do with those that having a few rows of um, just a traditional row garden isn't a big deal because that's the only place that I weed anything. But I thought that would be something that I would want to see somebody do, is to take all six of those methods and do them in the same year, under the same conditions, using the same fertilizer and the same water in the same temperatures and see which ones do best, which ones produce the most food, which ones are the least amount of hassle. And honestly, the reason I thought about doing the row gardens was because last year when I when I used the greenhouse to grow our whole garden, I didn't plant another garden. I just felt like the further we got into summer, the less happy things like carrots were. After a while, it just gets too hot in there for certain plants to survive. And so we didn't we got that initial harvest of carrots and things like that out of the greenhouse, but there gets to a point where your carrots shouldn't be inside anymore. They'll be so much happier out in the fresh air and the sunshine. And even though there's bugs, it, it feels like, it feels like to me with those hardier vegetables, you just get a better result when they're outside. Let's see how that looks. I think that's going to be pretty, hopefully, the girl I'm making this for thinks it's pretty. Sometimes I look, get a little bit caught up about like switching colors. I'm so excited to see what this one will look like next to that one. And then I forget that, well, what if it doesn't look good? You, you just spun it on. Now you can't take it back. <laughs> I should get things out and test them a little bit more. The funny thing about all this is that I love to spin these really colorful yarns for other people, but I don't like to wear them. I really like to wear really simple yarns, but I don't like to spin really simple yarns. I like to spin something that's complicated and that has lots of colors in it, and I just love that artistic process, but because they're natural fibers, I don't like to, um, how, how should I put this? Natural fibers last a really, really long time. At, when you compare them to the plastics, like the acrylics and stuff like that, the polyesters, the polyesters and everything look horrible after their first year. Whereas with wools and alpaca and mohair and things like that, they last forever. So the hats that I made 12 years ago, I still wear those because 
I don't need a huge amount of variety. I just love them and they still look beautiful. And so I, if I want to keep doing this thing that I love to do, I have to make them for other people because I have, I have no desire to make more for myself. I already have, I already have one hat that I love that is warm. So it seems so pointless to knit another one. So I have different fibers in this yarn. This one I'm doing, this part I'm doing right now is actually a mohair. And mohair is a lot stronger than regular like sheep's wool for the most part is stronger. Um, there are some sheep's wool that are pretty stinking strong. Oh, come on. It, it doesn't want to pull. Okay, so at this point, my bobbin is starting to fill up, and it doesn't want to pull as hard. And so as your bobbin starts to fill up, you do need to make little adjustments because now it's spinning high. It's putting a lot of twist in it to it, but it's not pulling as hard as I need it to, to stay consistent to what I've already made. So I just adjusted the knob so that it would pull a little bit harder. Otherwise, I'll have a lot more twist in this part than I do in the rest. And it won't be consistent, which is not what you want. You want consistency. Some of that, some of that will come out when you set the twist. And when you set the twist, what you're doing is you're getting your yarn wet with some cool water. You're letting it sit for a bit. And then you're hanging it from something with a very light weight at the bottom. And what that does is it, it pulls all the twists so that it's uniform and so that it won't kink up. Come on, cranky yarn. This part right here has a lot of silk in it. It's quite shiny. I've got to do my homework on this program tonight because next week I really want to be able to see questions. It makes me really stupid to just sit here and talk to myself. Those of you that know how to work this thing, do you want to get together with me and explain it to me? Okay, so what else? Is there anything else I can talk to myself about for a minute? Um, I did go to the fiber fair. And I had people that showed up, but I we never like met up because I got distracted by the fiber. And I was wandering the halls looking for people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I had a face memorized to look for. And so mostly I was just wandering around hoping somebody would recognize me. So I didn't see anybody, but I did get the fiber for Corinne, which is which was my initial reason for going. Yeah, I need it to pull just a little bit harder. Um so that was a score. <laughs> Melanie was supposed to go, but her car broke down. And then when I went over to get her, I like I had 17 boxes that I was taking out of my car because I got some beautiful presents from people. So I didn't actually buy everything that was in my truck. Uh, what I what I ended up getting was about three pounds of of roving that I can dye. And this that I got for Corinne, and I got some bottles of actual powder dye because I am running out of colors with all the orders people have been putting in. So that's what I got. But I got some really fun uh, presents from people. Susie sent me plants. And I was so excited when I opened it because I thought I thought she was just sending me like a currant and some raspberries. And then I got into it and there was nanking cherries and what else? Um, it almost looked like one of them was a grape, but it wasn't a grape. I think that was the currant. There were raspberries and nanking cherries and a tart pie cherry and fennel. It was so stinking exciting. And I did take videos of planting it in the swale. It is my first experiment of planting anything like that as well, and I hope that nothing drowns. What else? I got a shirt from Gary and some roving from Gary, which was really appreciated because I can always use more roving. And some hair breadths for the girls, and we got clothing for the girls. Oh my gosh, who gave it? The Sky's the Limit Farm sent us some really fun clothes and some pen pal stuff. For the girls. It was just a super, super fun mail day. 
it just came it it just all came as like really bad timing at the moment because I had gone to pick up all the mail before I went to the fiber fair and then um, and then Melanie needed us to bring the car over so I had to go from the truck the farm truck and try to fit everything into the Lincoln with four children <laughs> which was really fun um, Let's see, so you guys should go over and check out Melanie and say, hey Melanie, how's the, how's the vehicle? They sure had, I hate it when you have car trouble because it makes you realize how, how hard it is to get a whole bunch of kids around on a bike, you know, when you live in rural Idaho. Okay, so, Guys, my brain is empty. I want you to tell me honestly, don't you think that a half hour show would be better than an hour show? If I had somebody to talk to, I could talk for years. But if I'm sitting here not able to figure out how to use my own program, that's kind of a problem. Is there anything else I needed to talk about while I was here? Um, go, make sure to go check out uh, Brad's show tonight. He has his, his little show with Krista. And I don't know if Tommy's going to have his show up, if he's trying to do a, a, a dry run tonight or not. We were going to try and have it up. I, I think we were going to try and have it up this weekend is what we had agreed upon. Um, so if, if any of the stuff that I've used tonight, this I don't know if this is a shameless plug or not because I don't know how to spend without showing you my tools. But I do offer these tools on my Etsy store. I do have the drop spindles in the kits. I have the spinning wheels, and I have my homesteading books. And is there anything else? I'm sorry, I can't see your questions. If you have any questions, if any of you really wants to learn how to spin and you want some one-on-one -on -one help, I can do online consultations like this where we just do a hangout and I explain things to you. I do charge for it lately. I'm just, everything comes down to the, the pennies lately. So I also do the consultations for the YouTube channel if you want help with that. Lots of consultations. If you want some kind of Q&A information from me, go ahead and get a hold of me at dirtpatchheaven at gmail.com. Our Etsy store is dirtpatchheaven at Etsy. Anything else? I love you guys, and I guess I'll stop here so that I can go look at your uh, comments since I can't see them. Give me tips, guys. I don't know how to make the stupid program work. I love you, and we'll talk to you later, but only if I can figure out how to turn it off.